This video will talk about some of the conservation actions for rare plants that our program undertakes, and some that are hot topics in the conservation world right now that we are considering. Let's start by going over some of the biggest threats to rare plant conservation in New England that our program works to address. The first one is habitat destruction and conversion. This is a very big threat, especially with our world population growing and more and more urban and suburban areas expanding. We are now facing loss of habitat for rare plants and common native plant species as well. Oftentimes, we go looking for a historic occurrence of a rare plant species from the early 1900s and find that where the plants once occurred, it has been completely developed. Invasive plant species and insect pests also threaten our rare plants and again, common native plants as well as their habitats. Just as it was found in State of the Plants, these invasive species and pests are directly impacting our rare and native species. Two examples here are Asian bittersweet, Celastrus abiculatus, a species that was brought in from Asia, which vines up trees and can girdle the trees preventing sap flow and killing them, or pull trees down and outcompeting our native plant species until all that is left is Asian bittersweet. The other photo shows an insect pest that affects our hemlock trees. Suga canadensis, called the woolly adelgid, Adelgis tsugi. This is a problem even at Garden in the Woods, where the woolly adelgid is killing the hemlock trees. Insect pests like the woolly adelgid can affect rare plants by destroying their habitats. Change in natural systems such as changes in hydrology and fire. These are two aspects of the landscape that happen naturally, but are also being changed by humans in ways that affect the survival of rare species. Beavers are an important engineer of the New England landscape that many species have adapted to. They can cause natural changes in hydrology by creating wetlands that our native flora thrives on. Human activity of rerouting or filling in wetlands along with damming up rivers can have an effect on the flora that is very different from what beavers do. Fire in certain parts of New England is natural and helps to maintain habitats of coastal sand plains and rocky south-facing ridges. When suppressed, the habitat changes so that certain species may not do as well with the increased competition, or when a fire does come through, it burns hotter than it ever has before, damaging the plants that are usually tolerant of low-intensity frequent fires. Climate change is the big threat in the back of all of our minds. The effects are so great, especially because certain species have adapted to the current climate of the habitat they are in on the landscape. As climate change progresses, it is unclear if these plants can survive the change in temperature and moisture and evolve, or if they can move to better suited habitat. If not, they may become extirpated from our area in the future. There are a lot of unanswered questions and uncertainty in a future with climate change especially for the survival of rare plant species on the landscape. These six actions are different topics important to rare plant conservation that we act on and consider to help combat some of the threats faced by rare plant species. We will go over each one individually. First, we want to protect as much intact, diverse, complex habitat as possible. We want to increase connectivity between natural areas to facilitate migration. This is especially important with the threat of climate change. We also want to remove invasive species so they can no longer cause harm to native ecosystems or take over and push out native species such as Asian bittersweet can. Along with increasing connectivity, we want to build resiliency by maintaining large blocks of complex habitat. This helps ecosystems and species be resilient to the effects of climate change and help to prevent invasive species from getting a foothold. It is difficult for invasive species to take over in a large block of native species and ecosystem versus fragmented ecosystems. Larger blocks of complex habitat allow native plants to more easily move around and interact with other aspects of the ecosystem. Second, we monitor plant populations for health and threats. This is where our volunteers are essential to our program to help us with the large volume of monitoring needs across New England. We could not do it without the help of so many volunteers. Here are the species counts of rare plant species in New England from Flora Conservanda, both the original 1996 version and the 2012 updated version. 
In this table, focus on the Division I globally rare and the Division II regionally rare numbers. Notice in 1996, for both Division I and II, there are less species than in Division I and II in 2012. Thanks to monitoring efforts by our program, we found that globally rare plants we knew about went up by five more species in New England, and regionally rare plant species we knew about went up by 54 more species. Monitoring is so crucial to our understanding of what is happening to rare species. A few more numbers to go over the amount of monitoring we do. In New England, there are 62 globally rare taxa, or approximately 1,300 occurrences of plants on the landscape. There are also 326 regionally rare taxa, or approximately 2,000 occurrences of plants on the landscape. Over the course of the 25 years or so our program has been running, there have been over 10,000 surveys of rare plant occurrences by task force members, PCVs, and natural heritage programs. We also have thousands of seed collected and banked, 585 occurrences of over 200 taxa collected. Third, we collect and bank seed to preserve the genetic variation of the plants of New England. Before delving into the whys of seed banking, let's go over what seed banking is. While land and habitat conservation, called in situ conservation, is the dominant method of conservation in general, seed banks provide benefits that no other conservation approach can. In situ conservation protects against development, but taken alone, it cannot protect against various impacts that rare plants may be subject to. Ex situ conservation, one method being seed banking, is a method to help protect rare plants from natural habitat shifts such as succession, natural or anthropogenic catastrophes, invasive species, and climate change. Lance-leaved arnica is a globally rare species with a few populations each in Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. It is found in alpine ravines and sometimes on middle elevation stream banks. We seed bank this species to help protect it from threats that in situ conservation cannot. A population of seeds in a seed bank, if properly collected and curated, represents the genetic diversity of the source population more completely than a collection of live plants in a botanic garden. Unlike live plants or animals, seeds are safe from inadvertent artificial selection that can occur when plants are grown outside their original habitat. Furthermore, seeds in a seed bank may remain viable for hundreds of years, can be readily tested to monitor viability, and can be germinated and grown out at short notice should the original population experience a dangerous decline or catastrophic collapse. Seed banks have historically been focused more on crop species than wild plants, but that has changed considerably in recent years. Of the highest profile international seed banks that have received publicity, one pictured at the top is the Svalbard Global Seed Vault on the island of Spitsbergen, Norway, run by the Global Crop Diversity Trust and the Nordic Genetic Resources Center. It exclusively holds crop seed collection duplicates from regional crop seed banks all over the world. The second, pictured below, is the Kew Royal Botanic Gardens Millennium Seed Bank at Wakehurst Park in southern England. Started in 2000, it holds exclusively wild plant seeds from around the world and has recently met its first goal of banking 10% of the world's seed plants with over 1 billion seeds. We have contributed scores of species to the seed bank, but only common species as U.S. export laws forbid international shipment of federally listed plant materials. Closer to home, for 35 years there has been a network of small regional seed banks in the U.S., of which Native Plant Trust is home to one of the more important. Native Plant Trust is a founding member of this organization, and our seed bank currently holds 25 federally listed species for the CPC. In addition, our seed bank has over 200 regionally protected species there as well. Our goal for seed banking of rare species is the same as the International Convention on Biological Diversity Global Strategy for Plant Conservation, Target 8. At least 75% of threatened plants should be in ex situ collections, growing collections, and seed banks, preferably in the country of origin and at least 20% available for restoration and recovery programs. Seed banking and rare plant seed collections are going to be a very large part of our program, and it is important for volunteers to help as much as they can in this aspect. 
Our goal is to collect seed from species with 1 to 5 and 6 to 20 occurrences in New England, and also to collect from core and outlier occurrences of rare plants on the New England landscape. We have developed these widely used guidelines and use this method both to rank priorities for seed banking and to reject species that cannot benefit from being seed banked, such as recalcitrant or unorthodox seed. Volunteers are notified if their assigned species are to be targeted. Fourth, we manage habitats for rare and common plants where necessary and feasible. We need to think hard and make some decisions before we head out to manage a rare plant population. We first need to determine how to decide which rare plant sites to manage. Often, we have to look at three factors of a rare plant population before we manage it. First, we manage sites in habitats that are likely to persist under climate change. Second, management must be feasible, at least in terms of time and money, and have a good chance of success. Third, unfortunately, we will not be able to save all populations. The reality is we need to make some hard decisions for management work and pick the most logical rare plant populations to manage. We hope to provide opportunities for our volunteers to get involved and continue to help us with management work. We also augment, reintroduce, and introduce plant populations within the historic range as needed. This is not always easy to do, especially in the historic range where it once occurred and now no longer does. Oftentimes, these efforts are not successful, but I wanted to give you an example of one that was successful so you know it is possible to do. Sand Plain Gerardia, Agalinus acuta. This species grows in sand plain habitats in the Cape and southern coast of New England, and for some reason, it was growing in graveyards. There was something about the way graveyards were managed that this species continued to grow in them. We successfully introduced the species to Crane Wildlife Management Area, a habitat within its historical range where it still exists as a, an occurrence we monitor today. So it is possible to reintroduce species to their historic range, just challenging. Another example is Robin cinquefoil, Potentilla robinsiana. This species grows on top of Mount Washington in New Hampshire. We found that one population was on its way to become extirpated or going extinct on one part of the mountain. We augmented the declining population with plants we grew up from seed collected from a nearby thriving population and brought the counts back up to a stable level. Lastly, we plan manage relocation if necessary. This is a hot topic in the conservation world and we are still discussing and making decisions on whether this is a tactic we are going to take. Some conservationists are very much against the idea and some are very much for it. What is managed relocation? Managed relocation, also known as assisted colonization or assisted migration, is the intentional act of moving species, populations, or genotypes to a location outside their known historical distribution for the purpose of maintaining biological diversity or ecosystem functioning as an adaptation strategy for climate change. One species where this is occurring for is the Florida torea, torea taxifolia, and has sparked much debate. You can find information about this by searching online the species name or the torea guardians. I encourage you to check it out because it is an interesting case study of both policy and conservation on managed relocation. We at Native Plant Trust and NEPCOP are still deciding if this is something we should or should not do. There are a lot of questions surrounding this concept. Will NEPCOP assist plant migration out of their known historic range? If so, how do we pick the species and taxa this would most benefit and decide which ones this was not worth trying? When should this occur for a species or taxon? At what level of threat? How do we determine the level of threat before we move them? And do we possibly experiment before there is even evidence of any threat? Are we open, as New England, to receive rare species from further south? And who makes the final decisions and calls on how this works and if it should? There is still a lot of discussion about this and what the best practices are and if this is a good idea. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions, feel free to contact us.